Good Tuesday morning, and the Acts of the Apostles today is the story of the jailer, okay? This is a, there's some incongruity into it, a little bit, but not much. But you're going to see that the jailer has to be a pagan, okay? He works for the Romans, okay? Or whoever he works for. Maybe not. Maybe he's Jewish. I don't know. But all, I don't know. I doubt it. I'll read it to you. See, the crowd of, in Philippi. So you're outside. You're in Philippi. You're in Greek country now. Or no, in the sense you're in Asia, in the Middle East. Uh, uh, what am I trying to say? You're in, in Asia Minor. You're in the you're in the uh, Mediterranean, the Eastern Mediterranean. I think that's where Philippi is. The crowd in Philippi joined in the attack on Paul and Silas, and the magistrates had them stripped and ordered them to be beaten with rods. They're pagans. After inflicting many blows on them, they threw them into prison and instructed the jailer to guard them securely. When he received these instructions, he put them in the innermost cell and secured their feet at a stake. It was showing the attempt of the world to control the voice of the gospel. You <laughs> see, the innermost, you could see them being, they're really imprisoned. There's no holding back the gospel. There's no holding back the spirit of God, you see. About midnight, while Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns uh, to God as the prisoners listened, there was suddenly such a severe earthquake. The foundations of the jail shook. All the doors flew open and the chains all were pulled loose. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, thinking that the prisoners had escaped. Paul shouted out in a loud way, Don't arm yourself, we're here. He asked for a light and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you and your household will be saved. So they spoke the word of the Lord to him and everyone in his house. He took them in at that hour of the night and bathed their wounds that he and his family were baptized at once. He brought them up into his house and provided a meal. And with his household rejoiced at having come to the faith in God. That's a neat story. The earthquake shakes him loose. God is not going to let the church be uh, constrained. You see, they didn't do it. They were singing. They were praying and singing psalms. Okay? God took over and did the rest. He busted them loose. But then the, the, the jailer, he's got to be a pagan. I'm, I'm, I'm certain he's a pagan. Okay? He immediately recognizes the presence of God in this extraordinary event, and he listens to them, and he's baptized, and so is his family. It's, in a sense, it's stylized, the story is style. You hear this thing. They go from hearing the word to being baptized in, in their family, you see, in the whole family. The church is spreading by the grace of God, you see, by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Can't contain them. I think of our men, of my fellow passionists, who were imprisoned in China. They could still, you know, they couldn't, the prisons couldn't contain and constrain their faith. They never lost their faith, though they were, the men, I'm talking my fellow passionists, though they were brutally imprisoned, okay? They never lost their faith. And the people that they baptized, the Christians, the Catholic Christians of China and Hunan, they never lost their faith either, and some of them were martyred, or their families were martyred and ostracized and all the rest. They still had the faith. When our men went back, and I think I already told you this, when they opened up China again, our men went back, Marcellus, and I'm sure it was Marcellus White went back. I think Justin Garvey did too. They found the people still believing. You can't kill the faith. The story of the spread of Christianity is the spread of the attempt by the secular world, whether it was Roman or whatever, whatever it was, to squelch the faith, to imprison it, as it were. You can't. It's the truth. And even if, even if you're a complete, you see, it's five o'clock. Even if you're a complete secularist, you recognize that the desire for light and truth is compelling. You can't shut it off. Once someone sees that spark of wisdom, it's relentlessly pursued. You cannot, you cannot close the human heart and mind. You see, and the preaching of the gospel is a, is a preaching of hope through faith, especially a wisdom that can transcend 
the darkness of death and evil. That's the truth. When it is preached, even by very fallible preachers, it is heard because the heart is open to hearing its wisdom, hearing it. And in so doing it, it's compelling. That's what I think you see. You can't constrain it. Right now, it's ridiculed in the West. Many ways, faith is. It's taken a beating now. But actually, the truth be told, it's, it churches best when it is, as it were, ag agonistically connected to its culture, when it's struggling with its culture because it doesn't become comfortable. The worst thing that happened to Christianity in many ways is its identification with the culture. It creates a culture, but the culture, the culture also corrupted it. I think of the Renaissance. I think earlier, the church, the church leadership during the Renaissance was as neo-pagan as you could get. The best thing that happened to it was, in a sense, many sense, the Protestant Reformation. It, it forced us to look at the gospel again. I think that might be anathema to many people, but I don't think so. The church is always better when she's in the position of the apostles, in some ways getting her brains knocked out, because then she has to hold on to the gospel for the sake of the gospel itself, Christ, not the conference of wealth and power, which is what the church had. I think the church is way better off now than it was, I think, even in the Middle Ages, which was gloriously, it was a great time too. I mean, it has each time has its virtues, okay? But the church is always best when she preaches from within the prison. <laughs> you get it? When she can't count on comfort, when she has to preach to preach it authentically. And that's where she is now. I, I believe that. I think the church is better off now than it was, let's say, 50 or 60 years ago in American culture. We have to preach the authentic word today because we're being rejected by the culture. Our young people are not going to be conventional Christians and Catholics. They're not. They'll choose it, or they'll choose to reject it. You don't have just cultural Christianity anymore, not in the West. And you certainly don't have it in the East. Europe, Christianity is neo-dead. <laughs> it's almost dead, which makes the ground fertile for re-evangelization. No longer comfortable in its culture. The church now has to be authentic. I see that in our present Pope Francis. He's a missionary. He's a missionary. I love that guy. I really do. I do. I love his boldness, you see. He's not trying to keep the franchise. He's trying to spread the gospel. See, not playing defense. He's playing offense. In the best sense of the word. He's passing the ball, right? Like a quarterback, he's throwing the ball to his outside receivers. <laughs> and who are they? Asians and Af Africans, Asians, South Americans, see? That's the truth. He's not taken away from the line. He's not taken away from the uh, Europe or America. He's just thrown the ball. He's uh, get it. <laughs> it's a terrible analogy. I love his boldness. He's a good quarterback. He's an excellent quarterback. He plays to win. See, now how do you win? By throwing the ball. By throwing the ball. Aggressive. See, I think that's the church. That's the apostles. They went out there and they started throwing the ball, okay? And they got knocked in their butt plenty. When a quarterback drops back, he's vulnerable. But he still has to drop back this row. And that's what these fellows were doing. And some of the receivers were the most important receivers. They were the, re they were the women and the pagans and the jailers who received the faith, who caught the ball and ran to, for a touchdown. You see? I mean that. It's not a bad analogy. I never used it before. You're the first to ever hear it. Hey, it's neat, isn't it? Think of the, think of uh, the apostles as quarterbacks throwing the ball. It's where the church is today, throw the ball. Play offensively. Don't play defensively. <laughs>